we read in the uh, portion of Dvarim is the closing Sefer of the Chemisha Chumshi Torah it's referred as Mishnah Torah that because Moshe Rabbeinu is passing away he reviews many of the mitzvahs which I mentioned earlier Chumashi <coughs> A repetition, and there are a number of other mitzvahs which haven't been repeated in the earlier Chumashim are mentioned in the, the Chumash Advarim. It begins, these are the last 36 days of Moshe Rabbeinu's life. Moshe Rabbeinu is going to pass away in Zion Ador, and as the Pasuk says, as the verse says, this is the 11th month, the beginning of the 11th month, the first day of the 11th month of the 40th year in the desert. So, the, and Moshe begins giving Musa, rebuking words of admonishment to Klal Yisrael, where he recounts what took place over a 40 year period, and where they had failed, and because he's not going to be there to set them on that straight path in the future. As great as Yeshua was, who was a successor, but he was only a semblance of his teacher, as the Gemara tells us, that Pnei Moshe, Pnei Chamo, Pnei Yushuk, Pnei Levono, as the moon is a reflection of the light of the sun, identically, Yeshua was only a semblance of his Rebbe, of his teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu. And the reason why Moshe has to be the one to repeat the mitzvos, with the passing of Moshe, this was what we call the conclusion of the Torah itself, of the written law and the oral law. So therefore, until the last moment of Moshe's life, as we read at the, in the portion of Zosab Rocha, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I have no permission not to come and not to go. So Rashi cites Chazal the Midrash that all the Mayonos HaChochma, the wellsprings of wisdom, were closed down. Meaning that flow of information, which was Nevoa, which was prophecy, he prophesied in the wake state it came to an end at the very end of his life and that was the, that was the closing of the Torah Shebechsav and Torah Shebaal the written, the oral law at that moment so the last 36 day, days of his life before he repeats and reviews many of the mitzvahs and introduces a number of other mitzvahs he gives him words of admonishment The Pesach states, Reishis Choch Meir Hashem, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Meaning that for a person to be able to process the mitzvos and the Torah properly, it has to be predicated on Yir Shemayim, on fear of God. Fear doesn't mean, only mean fear of punishment, Fear means reverence, revering God. And of course, the more advanced the fear, the greater capacity, and the greater the worthiness of the person is that he has relevance to spirituality, to have a relation with God. Gemara tells us that the repository for Torah, or the gate that protects the Torah, <coughs> is what? is Yir Hashem, as it says, Yir Hashem Hi Otsoro, the Otsar, the storage location, the Torah is Yir Shamayim, is fear of God, reverence, the more you extol and you revere and you esteem at God, the greater God entrusts you with his Torah. So Chaim Veloshna writes in the Nefshah Chaim, his work in the fourth gate, Shar Dalid, a father has endless amounts of wheat and other assets and the son comes to the father and says father could you give me so many bushels of wheat so the father asks the son I'm happy to give it to you where are you going to store it he says well I'll put it in the street he says but you put it in the street the horses the wagons they're going to totally destroy it so what's the point of giving it to you if a person is Yerushamayim that means he esteems God he reveres God the Torah itself is seen and upheld 
in the most delicate, reverent way. If a person has no Yerushalayim, ha- doesn't revere God, doesn't fear God, what happens to the Torah becomes des- disgraced, becomes denigrated. Therefore, God is not going to trust you with something which is his chemdo, which is his lekach tov. He's not giving you his ultimate level of commodity. So Moshe is about to review the Torah. He's about to introduce new mitzvos. What is it predicated on? Elad Vorim. The opening statement, words of admonishment, words of rebuke, that the Jews themselves, this is the new generation. This is the generation which was less than 20 years old when it was decreed that they should perish over a 40-year period. This is the generation that's entering Teretz Yisrael. For them to have the capacity to fully appreciate what Moshe Rabbeinu was going to communicate to them, the repetition, review of mitzvahs, and the new mitzvahs, that, that they should have that capacity, one needs the musr. One needs the rebuke. One needs the admonishment. Because that's the prerequisite to have the capacity and the worthiness to be able to receive it and process it as it should be processed. So it begins Ela Dvorim. Ela numerically is 36. These are the words. It's 36 days before Moshe Rabbeinu is passing away. Asher Diber Moshe Kol Yisrael Bever Arden on the other side of the Jordan before they crossed because Moshe Rabbeinu didn't merit to cross the Yarden to go into Eretz Yisrael. Bamidbar, Barovo, and identifies various locations. The desert, the Arova, the plain, Molsuf, opposite, seemingly the Amsuf, Bain Poron, Bain Tofel, between Poron and Tofel, Volovon, Vachatzer, Sedizov. So Rashi cites Chazal, the Rav Yochanan states, he traversed all the Psukim in the Torah, in, in, in prophets, in scripture. There's no such location as Lovon. So all these words are really allusions to various things which took place in the past. Failings, setbacks, which took place over 40 years. Rashi cites Chazal, Omer of Yochanan, Chazan al Kol Mikro. He said he's reviewed all the text. There's no such location as Tofel and Lovon. Elochichon al Advarm Shetoflo al Amon Shu Lovon. It's because he rebuked them over issues that they took the, lo- the mon, they treated it, they questioned its value. They belittled the mon. Our souls are disgusted with this wafer-like light bread. alludes to this, the incident of the spies. It's all on an illusionary level. So Rashi again cites the Midrash. Why is he more explicit? Why when he gives him the Musr, when he's admonishing and rebuking them, he should be explicit. So Chazal tell us, it's make Kvod Neshel Yisrael. It's out of respect. So the Siv Sechachomim, who's the commentator on Rashi, elucidator Rashi, explains that here we're just beginning the Sefer, the fifth book of the Torah. The first thing we began opened with the, such serious failings. The full accounting of every failing of Klal Yisrael over a 40 year period. It's not really s- respectful. A little bit later in the Sefer is one thing, but the first discussion should be this. So, therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he speaks to them and it's presented in, and recorded, it's on an illusionary level. That it's not obvious. Out of respect, but they understood what it was. When he spoke to them, they clearly understood what it was. Over here, the Ramban writes in his commentary, Hasefer <laughs> Azeh Inyono Yodua Shu Mishneh Torah. He says, this book, its subject matter is known, and it's, it's a repetition of the Torah. It's a review of the Torah, Mishnah Torah. Yivar bo Moshe Rabbeinu ledor ha-nichnas boretz rov mitzvah ha-tzrich l'sisroel. He goes and he elucidates to the generation that's going to enter into the land, the majority of the mitzvahs which they need to live by when they're in Eretz Yisroel. 
Velo yaskebo dvar betoros dover betoros kahanim. Safe of the book of Vayikra, which is referred to as Torah, the laws of Kohanim, which are sacrifices, the laws which pertain to the Kohen, what, what qualifies him, what doesn't qualify, what disqualifies him, lo be masa korbonus, lo be tarsa Kohanim, the purity of the Kohanim, masem, their actions, shirag vir osim lohem, it's already, it's been explained and elucidated to them. Don't you repeat it? If you're repeating the laws which pertain to all Jews repeat the laws which pertain specifically to the Kohanim. The Kohanim is reason him. Lo yitzdorcho la hasora acha hasora because the nature of a Kohen, he does things with zeal and with alacrity. And a person who does things with zeal and alacrity, he doesn't have to, you don't have to repeat things for him. As they say, he gets it the first time. Meaning, evidently, in life, to appreciate something, what does one need? One needs focus. If you're focused and you always have that perspective and you don't, you're not distracted from that perspective, then you don't have to be reminded. One does not be reminded. The Kohanim, they were chosen to be deficients of God. They, they refer to as Meshur Elion. They accommodate God, they do the service. When Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai, after the Chet Ego said, Mila Shem Eli, even though the Levim, the Levites, were the smallest of the tribes, without any hesitancy, although they knew the consequences of that zealotry, they could be killed. When Moshe called for Mila Shem Eli, who's for God should come to me, they, they, they immediately, without any level of hesitation, they came. There was no hesitation. It was immediate, with immediacy. When Zimri, had a, when Zimri was killed by Pinchos, who was a levy at the time, but what did he demonstrate? He demonstrated the characteristic of what? Of a Kohen. There was no hesitancy. He only went to Moshe because he felt Moshe Benu should be the first one to what? To do the act of zealotry. Moshe says, no, since you're the first one, you, you should be the one to act. But again, that was Pinchos. This is the Midah, this is the innate characteristic of the Kohen. And the Talmud tells it, the Gemara tells us, Kohanim is Rizimheim. Although we say, Asay Siog the Torah, Asu Siog the Torah, you should make offenses for the Torah, there are certain situations which is discussed in the Talmud and the Gemara, which Kohanim don't need that fence. Because they have this inborn characteristic, they do things with alacrity. There's no hesitation. Their focus is directly to serve God. And that's why they act with such force and with such immediacy for that reason. It's reason him. It's interesting. Chazal tell us, Chachamein Zechron Levrocha, our sages of the Talmud, that Kohanim is reason him. Kohanim, when they do the service, they do it with alacrity, with zeal. And therefore, it's not necessary. So very often there's a question, is it their evaluation? Or somehow they were able to draw this from, from a certain location. So, what I had said, we find the Ritva, who was one of the early commentators on the Talmud. He writes, the law is that if Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, one does not blow the shofar. Why does one not blow the shofar? Because Chazal writes, explain, because there's a concern if the person is not really adept and proficient blowing the shofar, he may take the chauffeur, transport it four cubits in public domain, which is a Torah violation, to take it to a chocham, a person who's an expert, to teach him how to blow the chauffeur. Because the person may be so caught up and so enthralled by the mitzvah, he may not realize, and he may transport without thinking, and transport the four cubits in, in Rosh Hashanah, in public domain. Therefore, Chazal established a fence that said, and if Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, one does not blow the chauffeur. Because of this concern, somebody may trans end up transporting the chauffeur to be taught how to blow the chauffeur. So you would say, how do we know this? How do we know this? So you'd say, well, it's an evaluation. Chazal, they evaluated the possibility and the likelihood, therefore there's this concern. So there's your rights. There's such a thing we find in the Torah, it's referred to as asmachto. Asmachto. It's a verse in the Torah 
And the word is used as a reliance. And most times it's, it's sort of focus to explain it's misunderstood. For instance, there's an argument between the Rambam, Maimonides and Nachmanides, and Ramban, whether the obligation to pray is it a rabbinic obligation? We're talking about tefillah. The Amido is a rabbinic or is it a Torah obligation? Now, what is the verse which is cited by the Talmud which indicates that one has an obligation to say the Amida at once, once in 24 hours? It says, You should serve God with all your hearts. With your hearts. So the Talmud says, Eizu avodah What's the service of the heart? Tefillah. That is the basis. So Rambam writes, Maimonides writes, explains, that that's an authentic interpretation of the words. What's avodah shebelev? The Torah says you have an obligation to serve God with all your hearts. That's tefillah. Whatever tefillah is acknowledging first God, what God is making your request, and closing with the thank you. That's the modim. The Ramban writes, Nachmanri writes, no, on a Torah level, there is no obligation. That that the Talmud draws from these words, the Gemara draws from these words, that there's an obligation to pray, that's only asmach the Balma. It's a rabbinic reliance. The concept, the obligation is purely rabbinical, except they use the verse as a reliance to indicate that you're supposed to pray. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean it's a mnemonic? Is that what asmach to mean? That's what it means? I mean, if you want to not forget that you have a rabbinical obligation to pray, they have to find the word to be a reminder, a mnemonic, to hang your hat on. That will remind you. Okay? Is that what it means? It means something much more profound than that. How do we know the Gemara cites two verses in regard to the mitzvah, the obligation of blowing the shofar, with the hearing the blast of the shofar Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is referred to as Yom Trua the day of the blast. And there's another verse which refers to Rosh Hashanah as Zichron Shua, the remembrance of the blast. So the Talmud asks, the Gemara asks, is it the day of the blast or is it the remembrance of the blast? So the Gemara reconciles the both verses by saying, if Rosh Hashanah falls out during the week, then it's the day of the blast. Then you blow the shofar. But if it falls out on Shabbos, then it's only the remembrance of the blast. We say verses which refer to the shofar, but act in actual we don't blow the shofar. Why? Because there's a concern that you may transport the shofar in public domain four cubits. Therefore, that's zichron. It's only remembrance of the blast. So the Ritual writes, maybe you would say, Chazal understood the vulnerability of forgetting and not being sufficiently focused. person may be enthused and thrilled by the obligation and he may transport it. Therefore, we use Zichron Shua as a mnemonic. So he says, that's, that's, that's not the correct understanding. He says, when the Torah writes Zichron Shua, the Torah, it's the equivalent of a red flag. The Torah is alerting you that there is this flaw in every human being that when he feels he has a certain level of obligation, he may have that momentary lapse of cognizance, and he may transport. Now, all rabbinic laws are what are endorsed by the Torah. That that the Chazal, the rabbis, are vested with the power to enact, promulgate, legislate laws, that, that's on a Torah level. Los, los sosum you should not deviate from what they, they, they direct you. You have to follow what they legislate. But, why, but what, why are they legislating defense in this particular area? Because the Torah itself is alerting us that there's such a thing as zikron shua. On the Torah, of course, you blow the show for Rosh Hashanah. that falls out on Shabbos. But they're alerting us that Shabbos is a day that has relevance only to the zikron. It's up to Chazal to choose, do they act and legislate defense or don't they? So it's not they had a concern and we use the word as a mnemonic, but rather the concern is alluded through the verse by the Torah saying, Zichron Shrua. It's a remembrance of the blessed. As a result of that, we know that this is a shortcoming in the human being. This is a blind spot. There may be this lapse, and if there's this lapse, Shabbos could be desecrated. 
So it's not they had the understanding, but rather everything emanates from the, Torah, from the text itself, from the Torah itself. And the Ratva writes, and a person who does not believe this is the understanding of Asmachto, ain't lo chelu b'toros Moshe Rabbeinu. He's considered classified as a heretic. That's how strongly he speaks. So now, the Torah says, Love the b'chol You should serve God with all your heart. It's a mnemonic. You'd say, well, you know, it makes sense to serve God. And you know something? To remember that, it, that it's the right thing, although it's purely rabbinic, we found the pasuk. No. Love the b'chol says, it's, it's something very valuable. Although it may not be an obligation. The obligation, according to Nachmanides, Ramban, it's rabbinical. Eza Avodah should believe which service is the service of the heart, that's Amidah, that's Tefillah. So, go, so again, where is it emanating from? It's emanating from the Pesach, from the verse itself. There's a famous word from uh, Rabbi Yersim of Tvinsky writes, although there's an argument between the Rambam and the Ramban, whether Tefillah, whether the Amidah is a Torah obligation, but everybody agrees, he says, even Nachmanides agrees, Ramban agrees, that the concept is a Torah concept. You may not be, may, may not be obligated to pray, but when you pray as you should pray, actually it opens all the channels. There is a communication between the person and God. Otherwise, how do we know you could even speak to God? Right? The answer is, the Pesach, when it says, love though, you could serve God with all your heart. Although it may not be an obligation, but the concept is a Torah concept. So again, so even according to Ramban, the verse itself is alerting you and making you aware that you can't speak to God. There is such a thing as service of the, of, of the heart, which is tefillah. So that the Chazal, they understand that there's something unique about the Kohen, the Kohanim is reason him. How do they know that? Was it their evaluation? They read history and they say, well, we see Kohanim, they, they do things with zeal and alacrity. It started with Shimon and Levi when they destroyed this, the city of Shechem, when Dina was defiled. Or was it the story with, with, with Mila Shem Eli, or the story of the Chashmanoim, that they were the zealots uh, to drive out the Greeks out of Eretz Yisrael, when they, when they desecrated the sanctuary in the base of Migdosh? Is that what it's about? That that the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu did not repeat Torah's Kohanim in Sefer Dvarim, which is Mishnah Torah, why did you repeat it? Because they are the reason. Because they do things with zeal and they don't procrastinate, they don't hesitate, and they address the obligation immediately, meticulously, that reveals that the c- characteristic of the Kohen is Zoris. He's a person who does things with zeal and lacry. So, so it's not it's their evaluation. They, it's, everything is extrapolated from the Torah itself. That that Moshe Rabbeinu did not repeat Torah's Kahanim confirms and establishes Kohanim's reasoning. The Kohanim, that, that, that is the essence of who they are. Now, the Rabban writes something interesting. I explained why does Sefer Dvar and Mishtor begin with rebuke, with admonishment, with Musr, Tochocho. As I said, because to give the person the capacity. So he explains the Ramban, before he began elucidating and presenting the Torah, he begins with rebuke, to remind them of their shortcomings, their sins, to what degree did they defy, did they rebel against God in the desert? And to what degree, despite their lack of deservingness, despite all that, God had exceptional rachmin for them. To reveal, he's telling him, he real how seriously he failed. It was literally, un- he shouldn't have forgiven you. He did. So despite all the setbacks, and all the regression, <coughs> and all the, whatever happened, the punishment, but after everything said and done, it's a display of unlimited mercy that Hashem showed you. Shows the Rachmim. In addition, 
to make them aware that there's a consequence to every action. As you sinned in the past, and the consequence of that was you were held back and you were seriously obstructed, you do the same thing, it's going to repeat, history repeats itself. and to strengthen them the God who always the Midas Arachman is always in place therefore Jew never should despair never as in the past despite all the serious strain on the relationship ultimately Hashem came through with the Midas Arachmim, the attribute of mercy is always there as much as Satan the Satan prosecutes and he allows his head to be reared, which activates the attribute of justice, but how long does it last? Relatives, it's for a moment. That's all it is. But what overtakes the relationship? Midas Arachmin. That always comes back into play. You know, it's interesting. Talk about the Holocaust. Six million Jews murdered by the Nazis in Marshall all the Torah centers in Europe decimated the Svarim Sifri Torah burnt, desecrated destroyed everything in the most vicious way what happened afterwards? So it's Midas Adin, no question it's the attribute of justice such an overwhelming Midas Arachmin the Jews were able to come reestablish all the Torah centers reestablish their communities all the education, everything to a degree, in, on, at least uh, on a quantitative level, and in terms of families, numbers of, of Jews that are born, and so on and so forth, this is not to be imagined, the level of Rachman, but after such Midas Adin, is it possible to believe that you'll see the light at the end of the tunnel? But that was the platinum lining in, the, in, the, in that dark cloud. Ultimately, Hashem will not allow it. He always displays the Rachman, even more forcefully. I think the Chobetz Chaim said this in the 1600s there was a, a Tartar his name was Chomnitsky he destroyed he was the equivalent of Hitler he destroyed most of Eastern Europe plundered and wiped out all the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe Chomnitsky and after he did this there was such a resurgence of Torah the greatest Torah sages came into being Ribki Eger. all the great Torah sages in 17 the Vilna Gon uh, the Ktsos HaChoshen the Nsiv Samishpot I mean the greatest all of them will, what happened you know after such a setback the greatest Torah sages were murdered were killed by this by this Tartar you know said Hashem says enough there's going to be a new resurgence of Torah that's Midas Arachmi. There's always the Midas Arachmi. But if you don't see it soon enough, Chas Sholem, God forbid, you despair. Hashem says, never despair. Midas Arachmi is always there. And that's L'chazik Libom, to strengthen the hearts. Shloyom Odom, Lunucha, Lareshes, Esoretz, Kein Odom, Ashalu Yechto. How could we ever, how could we survive this? There's nobody perfect. Immediately God's going to rain in on us. Moshe Rabbeinu is, is, is making known to them, is informing them. Hashem is overwhelming with me with the attribute of Rachmim. For forgiveness at many levels is actually an assistance and a support for people to serve him. Knowing that. as David says in God has the ability to forgive. Of course you have to be fearful because you want him to forgive. But ultimately he is forgiving.
over here, we find that Moshe Ben only rebuked Klal Yisrael right before he passed away. During the 40-year period, he did not rebuke them. So Rashi said, Chazal. It says, It was the 40th year, the 11th year, the first day of the 11th month. He only rebuked him right before he was about to pass away. Pass away. It was the last 36 days of his life. From who did he learn this? Miyakov. He did not rebuke his children until literally he was on his deathbed when he gave them the blessings. He blessed them and he rebuked them simultaneously. Omar, what did he say? Ruven b'ni. Ruven failed. What did Rabbi Ruven do? After his mother, after his mother passed away, after Rachel, the man who passed away, he took the concubine's bed and put it in his tent rather than his mother's. And he went without consulting with his father, asking permission, and he took his father's bed and put it in his mother's tent. Omar, as a result of it, he forfeited many things. It was considered very serious. Omar Ruven Bini, Ani Omaloch, Mene Maloch, Tichok Lashem Alolo. He said, Ruven, why did I give you, rebuke you, admonish you all these years? This happened in Canaan when he was, when he was young. Kadesh Lo Tenecheni, was some concern, but if, if I would have, you would have left me. Vetelach, Vesidbak, Beisavochi. You would have gone and attached up to Ace of my brother. Therefore, I was concerned by giving you Musr, by giving you rebuke, you would have been devastated and through, as a result of that devastation, you would have gone and attached up to Ace of. And let's understand it. A person, Ruvain, he's the Bechor. He's Yaakov's firstborn. If his father rebukes him, he's going to worse than the devil. He's going to Esav. He's giving it all up. He's become a heretic. He's, Esav said, Les din les dayon. There's no judgment. There's no judge. Is that where he's going? How do we understand it? But Yaakov was concerned. Now, factually, when Yosef was sold into slavery, Reuven was not there. Right? He originally said, put him in the pit, and he comes back, he finds he's no longer in the pit. Where was he? So Rashi cites two interpretations. Either it was that day to serve his father, that's why he was there, or he was preoccupied with doing tshuva, with his sackcloth and his fasting. That's what he was preoccupied. He was consumed with tshuva, with re- repentance, sackcloth and fasting. So what did he need rebuke? Why did he need rebuke? Seemingly, he fully embraced the wrong they understood, he embraced the failing and he tried to make amends. So what did he, what, what did he need rebuke for? Evidently, somehow, he, he was sensitized to his failing. So what's Yaakov said, you know, the reason why the rebuke of all these years is because why there's a mitzvah to hit a person over the head even though he'll do tshuva on his own. Seemingly, it says that his teeth were blackened from fasting. It was to that degree. So what exactly did Yaakov say to us, Ruvain, you know why I didn't rebuke until the day of my, that I'm dying is because I was concerned you may attach yourself to Esav, my brother. Firstly, who activated, who sensitized Ruvain to do Shuvah's Yehuda when Tomer was going to go be burnt and he admi- openly admitted, I fathered the children. So he said, so it could be many. So when, Ruben, when Yehuda went and publicly announced that he failed, that he was a sinner, that sensed Ruven uh, to do tshuva. Vezos the Yomar. When Moshe Rabbeinu prayed that Yehuda's bones were restless in the, in, in the coffin for 40 years, Moshe prayed for the reinstatement of Yehuda. He should enter into Yeshiva Shamala, into the heavenly Yeshiva, by saying, he's the one who caused Reuven to do tshuva. This is unrelated, unrelated to Yaakov. Unrelated to Yaakov's rebuke. So what does it say over here? Yaakov had a rebuke him at the end of 40 years, at the, right before he passed away. Just to understand it. We read a story in the Torah 
that just read it recently, there, there was but no Slavchot. The daughters of Slavchot, Slavchot only had daughters, they had no sons. And there was a question of inheritance. Does a daughter inherit if there are no sons? So they came to Moshe Rabbeinu and they said, the way we understand we deserve, we are heirs. And we have a right to our father's estate. Because our father was not part of the Adas Korach. Was not part of the congregation of Korach. Because they forfeited all their rights of inheritance. <coughs> if we have a right. But factually the father was put to death. God said he must be put to death. What did Slavka do? That he deserved to die? So the Gemara says, there's a question, what he, he violated Shabbos. He went and he reaped on Shabbos. Now the question, why did he reap? Why did he reap? So the Gemara says, the reason why he reaped, he did it for the sake of God. What did he do? We rule out on a halakha level that if a person does a creative activity on Shabbos, not for the sake of the creative activity, but the creative activity is only a byproduct of your intent you're not in violation of Shabbos. For instance, all the 39 classifications of creative activity is, is extrapolated, is drawn from the Mishkan. Everything they did in the Mishkan was creative, was not destructive. And any creative activity was done in the Mishkan was done for the sake of the action itself. So now, if a person digs a hole and he has no interest in the hole, he's only digging the hole for the earth. He's not, according to Rav Shimon, which is one opinion in, in Talmud, which we rule this way, he's not in violation of building. Digging a hole is like digging a foundation. That's building. That's violation of Shabbos. But if you dig the hole, not for the hole, but only, the hole's only a byproduct of your intent where you want the earth, you're not in violation of Shabbos. But let's say a person wouldn't know that. And his intent is to dig the hole for the earth, but he says, I'm digging the hole for the hole. And he's forewarned by witnesses he'll be put to death. Although he knows the truth. And God knows the truth. But based on the way it's understood and it's witnessed, he'll be put to death. After the Chet HaMaraglim, the story of the spies, God says, they will come to an end and they're going to die. They have no share in the world to come. Initially, the generation of the, of the spies, those between 20 and 60, the person here is, he's going to perish, never go into the land, he has no share in the world to come. They say, you know something? That means all my obligations as you are totally irrelevant. We'll, we'll not keep dietary laws, we won't observe the Shabbos. So what did Slavka do? He went intentionally violated the Shabbos by reaping to show them that the laws are still in, in place. And you have full liability. You're fully culpable. And he was put to death but in reality, only he and God knew his true intent. Even Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know his intent. Because what he did, what he had done, he really didn't violate the Shabbos. Because why did he reap? He didn't reap because he wanted the wood. He reaped to teach the lesson that the laws are still in effect. So if that's the case, the malacha, the creative activity, reaping is only a byproduct of his intent. So in fact, he was a tzaddik. He was willing to die for the sake of Klal Yisrael. That's the idea. Because the, the Jews themselves felt totally disenfranchised and they were depressed and they would have totally violated the Torah. Now because Reuven switched the bed of his, of his father into the tent of his mother, Leah, what did he forfeit? Being the Bechor, the firstborn, he was meant to be the Kohen. He was meant to be the king. He had every right and level of distinction which he forfeited because he was impulsive. If a person is told, you know something, because of your impulsive behavior, you're disenfranchised. You've been reduced to nothing. What does a person feel? So what's my worth? What's my value? Nothing. You know something? I'm out the door. I'm, I'm going to join with Esau. We're not talking about understanding the nature of his sin. Of course he understood that. That Yehuda already, when Yehuda publicly admitted that he fathered the children, that alerted Ruvain he has to treat the tshuva. Sackcloth, fasting, remorse to the depths of his being. There's not, not a question. But Yaakov said a lot more than that. Pachas kamayim, like you're, you're like flowing water. The impulsivity that you have. Therefore you can't, you're not qualified to be the king for leadership. And you're not qualified to be the coin, to be efficient. 
That's what he told me right before he died. If he would have told them it earlier, so what am, what's my worth? I have no worth. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about just making a person aware that he has to do tshuva. It's by giving him the full gamut, the full understanding, and the ramifications of what it brought about the sin. That's what we're talking about over here. Factually, because of what happened during the, all the various ten times they sinned in the desert, that was one of the reasons why Moshe Beno didn't go into Eretz Yisrael. Why didn't they have that more advanced level of leadership? Because they, they themselves weren't at that level. They weren't at that level. As the Orachim Akkad says, if Moshe Rabbeinu, anything Moshe Rabbeinu was involved in re- remained eternally. The Mishkan was forever. If Moshe Rabbeinu would have gone to Eretz Yisrael and built the Beis HaMikdosh, the Beis HaMikdosh would have never been destroyed. The reason, one of the reasons why Tisha B'Av is a Moed, is a holiday, because God expended His wrath on the stones and wood, not on us. But Chas V'Sholom, if He wouldn't have that, we would have been destroyed. So Moshe Rabbeinu, His not going in was, was a blessing. That is a Klal Yisrael. It was the ultimate Kiddush Hashem. That God took, destroyed, took the collateral. It's referred to as Mishkan. It's collateral. God took as collateral the, the first base of Mikdush, the second base of Mikdush. It would have been Moshe's edifice that he created, it wouldn't have been taken. So if the Jews were at a level that they wouldn't have sinned again, they would have had Moshe's leadership. But because they weren't, but what, how do you know they weren't? Well, if because of what transpired ten times in the desert, after being at a Sinai, that tells me, tells me you're not there. If you're not there, what's the future? You're prone to fail again. You're prone to fail again, that means God's wrath has to be expended. So w- w- you have a choice. Either on, on the stones and brick, on stones and wood, or on you. If it's Moshe Rabbeinu, it's a problem. If Moshe Rabbeinu cannot go in. So that, that's the understanding. <coughs> Over here, the Rachaim Kodesh, he explains all the various locations on an illusionary level. And it all has to, to, to do, do with Torah. What qualifies a person to have relevance to Torah? Moshe Rabbeinu is telling him things that what gives you capacity to merit the ultimate level of Siyat Dishmaya, of divine assistance, to come upon Torah. So he explains... The Ever Yardin. What is Ever Yardin? What is that friend? It means the other side of the Jordan. The Saki will chicham at your Ever Yardin. He says, Bamidbar Barova. He says, Aleph. She lokech mi dosu shel Avram. The Chsiv. Every Jew has to have the characteristic of Avram Avinu. Avram ho Ivri. What was Ivri? Took the world on single handedly. You can't compromise yourself, regardless. Who Mashiromas Bomro Beaver Bays. She Mardus Belibo Tomid. A person always has to feel rebuked within himself. Like smitten within yourself. Komram Sal Tovet Mardus Achs Belibo Shalodom Me Malkios. If a person is oblivious to, to doing something wrong, he's oblivious. He really doesn't value it. You could give him lashes and beat him a hundred times. If his perspective doesn't change, he's going nowhere. So you, you, so he's bruised. But if a person takes it to heart and he realizes he's wrong, even once, that, that's, that has greater value than being, receiving a hundred lashes. Fumashe Roma's Hayyartein, Mardus. Lash, rabbinic lashes are referred to as Marcus Mardus. Rodem means to take, take control. Gimel midis hanova. Humility is crucial. Why? Ba'omram lo lemiosem ha'atzmo kibnidbar. A person should be just as a desert has no character. It's desolation. There's nothing to show for it. And it's ownerless. And it's there for everybody to trample. That's, that alludes to a person if he has that characteristic he has relevance to the Torah. Dalet shli hanova b'der hanos. 
When a person's humble, it has to be with a qua- on a quality level. A person who feels he's, it's not you feel you're worthless. Humble person knows his worth. Except, but there's no therefore. I may know, Moshe Benu knew he was more, knew more than anyone. He's more capable than anyone. But he's still the most humble person who ever, who ever worked the face of the earth. Why? Because there's no therefore. I am what I am because that's what I'm supposed to be. There's no taking personal credit for anything. That's what I'm here for. It's like a person, today we've reached a level that the person works for a company, he's honest, he comes on time, but he never closes a deal. So he comes to bonus time, he says to the employer, I think I deserve a bonus. He says, you know why? I never stole from you. You never stole from me, but that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be an honest employee. But I always came on time. Well, you're supposed to, I, I'm paying you to be here so many hours a day. That's not a basis for a bonus. The same thing. A person is It says in Yovos, If you learn the enormous amount of Torah, don't, pat, don't pride yourself. God says, what, what do you think I put you on the face, the face of this earth? I gave you an intellect. I gave you health. I gave you whatever I gave you. All the amenities of life. What? Only to be invested in Torah. So you, are you going to pride yourself? Does a pride, person pride himself that he breathes so many breaths a, a minute? And his eyes blink so many times a minute? There's nothing to pride. That's the function of a human being. So a person, when you demonstrate and display your humility, you behave within a humble context, it should be not in the disheveled state. It should be in a quality way. Hey, the fifth characteristic. He quotes the mission figure. And you will not sin. You consider three things you'll never sin. From where do you come, where you're going, before who you will stand. Where are you going, before who will you give a reckoning. You should do tshuva the day before you die. person always should realize in a moment you can be taken. So the, as a result of that, y- you never know when your last moment is. So a person will do tshuva continuously throughout his life. You should be facing the end. Sof. You should always see yourself, you're at the very end. So if you see yourself at the very end, one will always be in a state of what? Of tshuva. Vav maimer chasidim. A porush, a person who's an aesthetic, a person who separates himself from physicality. Tzoloso b'fanov, it's the words of the Chobos Lavovos, duties of the heart. There's always a smile or a glow on his face. But dagaso b'avlo belibo, but there's always a worry in his heart. Maybe he didn't perform well enough. Outwardly, you're ecstatic. You feel privileged that you're a Jew. You have privileged for whatever you did. But simultaneously, did I really do it well enough? Keeps going with the various characteristics what one's commitment has to be. So it's interesting. There's a Rambam. The Rambam writes in the laws of Talmud Torah. He speaks about the characteristic of humility, which is crucial. And a prereqs with the Torah. And he writes, Divri Torah Nipshul Kamayim. The words of Torah are analogous to water. Shenemar quotes a verse from the, from the prophets, from the Novi. Hoi kol Whoever is thirsty should go towards the water. Now, there's a word from Rav Shach, Zech Tzarek Levrocha. He says the law is. If a person drinks a liquid, a beverage, and he's not thirsty, let's say you want to drink some juice to take some medication, not to quench your thirst, one has to say a bracha before you drink that liquid. Why? Because the liquid itself has an innate taste to it, so there's a benefit. What about if one drinks water and it doesn't quench his thirst to any degree, and you're only drinking the water to be able to take the medication? 
one does not say a shako. One does not, it does not be predicated on the bracha. Because the water value, the value of water is to quench your thirst. And if it doesn't have that effect, it's not considered, you're not benefiting. But any other beverage which has a taste, whatever the taste is, as long as it's potable, you have to say a bracha because there's a benefit. So he said, the Navi says, Hoi kol tzomei luchu the thirsty one should go to water. And water is Torah. Why, why the thirsty one? If Torah is water, go, to the, go, go study Torah, which is the equivalent of water. So you see that the only time the water, Torah resonates and affects a person, you have to have some degree of interest in studying it. If there's no interest whatsoever to study it, it's like water. It has no value. So therefore, it's... Thirsty, go to the water. So what I said was, the Ramam writes that a father, based on, on the psukim, on verses, a father has an obligation to teach his son Torah. A grandfather has an obligation to teach his son Torah. Then he writes, Kol chochem v'chochem Yisrael. Every person who's a chochem has Torah knowledge. Chayov l'lami es ha-talmidim. He has an obligation to teach the students. So this is an obvious question. You're a student after you've been taught. Not prior to you taught. You only become the students once you are taught. So what do you mean? A chocham, kol chocham, has an obligation to teach the Talmidim. You're not a student yet. So what does the Rambam mean? Is that Talmidim? So what I explained to Rambam, the Rambam saying that a chocham only has a person who's a, a Talmud chocham, a Torah, a person who's knowledgeable in Torah only has an obligation to teach the student if he has an interest in teaching. If you, have, if you have an interest in being a student, then I must teach you. But if you have no interest in being a student, I have no question, why not? The answer is because if you have no interest, I'm not teaching you Torah. Because Torah is like water. And water only has value if there's some interest. There has to be some degree of interest. If there's no interest, I have no obligation to teach you. That's what he's writing. Lomaloch. Mamayim enem skatsim mimokom madron. Water does not gather on an incline. On an elevated location, El Nischoli Me Olav, it flows off it. Umiskapsi Bimokum Ashboran, and it gathers in a lo- lower location. Kahdivri Torah in Imtsoim, Begasia Ruach, Vilo Belev, Kogova Lev. Not a person who has an inflated spirit, a person with an uplifted heart. El Bedaki Shval Ruach, a person who is broken and low spirited. Shemis Avik Bafa Ragle Chachomim, which it says in Pirke Ovos. You should roll in the dust of the Torah sages. Now, so I asked the question, seemingly, David Amelo says, Ezel, I mean, Pirkei Ovid says, Ezel Chochem, who's a wise man? Halomi Nikol Odom. That you're willing to st- learn from anyone. And it cites a posuk, a verse from David Amelo, from Thilim, Bikol Malam Hiskalti. From all those who teach me, I became wiser. I became more, more, more intelligent. I had greater understanding. There's certain people, they have a desire for knowledge. Where do you see knowledge? Is if you're willing to roll in the dust of, of the Chachobim, that's the indication of humility. I'll give you an example. A person is a student of physics. And he has the opportunity to study, to be mentored by Einstein. But Einstein says, you know, there are no, there, there are no seats in the classroom any longer. You're going to have to sit under my desk and my feet are going to be on top of your head when you hear the lecture. You want to know something? To learn from Einstein, it's worth it. Because if you have that desire to be mentored by the greatest physicist, it's worth it. That's not misavik Bafar Aglayim. So how does that show humility? The person has a desire, he's willing to do anything to acquire that, that quality of knowledge. How does that show humility? The man could be pompous, self-centered, egocentric, everything. But, but I want to be the greatest physicist. They, I'm willing to do anything for that. So what's the proof that you misavik bafar aglayim? Because you're willing to roll in the dust at the feet. So what I said was the ram is not finished. You're willing the person is will roll in the dust of the feet. Umesirataivos the tanugi asmam libo. He's willing to remove the desires and all the pleasures of the time of his life from his heart. Now. A person, as a human being, we have desires. Natural, we're inclined to desires. We're only human. A person is willing to forego that. 
a, right? He's made with Tivus Libo. Even something which is so basic to the human person and the pleasures of time. And you work to a small degree only enough to support yourself that you have enough to eat. That's the level of commitment. Now, every person says, you know, I'm only human. Don't I have a right? The moment you say you have a right, that's entitlement. If a person is Maser, Taibus for Tanugi Azman, that's a confirmation that this is true humility. The man says, I am not, I'm entitled to nothing. Not even to what's basic, to the human psyche. Even that I'm not entitled to. I'm willing to remove everything. Because who am I? It's unheard of. The only person who processes something in this context, the person is truly humble. True humility is, I have no entitlement. I'm here to do a job. I'm here to do the will of God. That's true humility. We read in Pirkei Ovos that you should be mit Talmidi Aaron. Who was who was Aaron Hakohen? He was Oiv Sholem Veroiv Sholem. He loved peace and he pursued peace. So the obvious question is, why is the Nafsi? You should be from the students of Aaron. He loved peace. You should love peace. Everybody loves peace. The, uh, on whose terms? What are you willing to do for peace? So the Talmud says, the Gemara tells us in the Dorim, that a man says to his wife, he makes a vow, that unless you go spit the high priest in the eye, you're forbidden, you're, all my assets are off limits to you. You know what that means? That means the marriage is over. The woman is not permitted to benefit from any of his assets, the husband's assets. Is the woman going to spit in the, in the, the coin goddle? Is, is, is under the king? He's the most prestigious station in Klal Yisrael. Is she going to spit in the coin goddle's eye, in the high priest's eye? Aaron becomes aware of this, what happened. He understands. Unless he intervenes, the marriage is over. So he goes to the wife and says, You know something? I have a certain eye ailment. The doctor says, The only thing that will heal it, I need fresh saliva. That's come straight out of your mouth, straight into my eye. Could you please spit in my eye? You understand? That's Rodev Sholem. Rodev Sholem, meaning everybody loves peace. What do you want to do? What's, what do you want to sacrifice? The sacrifice is the qualifier that you truly love peace. I'm willing to roll in the dust of the greatest scholar's feet to drink of their wellsprings. Sure. Why are you drinking from the wellsprings? Because you want to be whatever. You have your own ulterior motive. You have your own ego that you're stroking. You want to flex your own muscle. But a person is willing to be Mesa Tavas Libo Tanu Azman, the desires of his heart and all the pleasures of life, and say, It's all meaningless to me. What does that say? I have no entitlement. I'm entitled to nothing. That's true humility. If a person is able to understand that he has no no rights, no entitlement, it's a privilege. When a person says, we say every morning, Ashrenu Matov Chalkenu Manorango Lenu. We say how fortunate we are, our lot, our portion. And we say, Right? We, we, we give praise. He didn't make us as he made the nations of the world. Our lot is not their lot. We give thanks to you that you're our God. We give thanks. What are we giving thanks for? Not because of the miracles, that you're our God. You chose us of all the nations of the world. What does that mean? But you know, that comes with a heavy, heavy price. That means you, you, you're dedicated. Every aspect of your life is bound to God. We give thanks for you. We give thanks to you for that. The, if you really appreciate and understand what you're saying, it's the ultimate level of negation to God. To be able to say, I give thanks despite the cost factor. It's like Lahavdol Elif Abdolus to differentiate between pure and, and ordinary. Holy well, ordinary. The person says, I won't pay anything for because the profits I'll make in a year now will be multiples of what I paid for it. And the person on the so, but you're giving away everything. You don't. I'm giving away. Uh, this is the old. Lahav the love of those. Every aspect of your life is bound and bound up with. But who's it bound up with? This is the ultimate thanks. 
But you have to appreciate that, what that is. We're going to read in the Torah on Tisha B'Av, the Navi says, Al Yisel Chochme Chochmoso. The wise man should not pride himself in his what? In his wisdom. And the rich man in his wealth. And the strong man in his power. What should you pride yourself? Your do'osi. That you know me. That's what you have to pride yourself. That's the ultimate. But if you know me, you're bound. But that's the ultimate.